Thanks to Civic Camp for partnering with us uh, in tonight's debate and uh, really making this event happen. I'd also like to thank all the candidates that were able to make it out tonight. Uh, we know that campaigning takes up a lot of your time and we're really happy to see that you could all make it. So thank you for that. As well as thank you to all of those who are in the audience tonight for coming out, uh, being engaged in, in civil politics. It is huge and uh, we're really grateful that you could all make it. As, uh, as I'm sure you well know, Ward 1 is, is an open race for the first time in 30 years as uh, there's no incumbent running. So I think it's going to be a really interesting race. And I've had the opportunity to meet with each one of these candidates. And I'm really looking forward to uh, all the, the lively discussion that will take place here tonight. I'd also like to tell you guys about the uh, advanced polls that we have in Mac Hall this week, October 9th to 16th. Those will be open from noon till 7 p.m. each day. And those polls are all multi-constituency. So whichever ward you live in, uh, I'm assuming most of you guys are in Ward 1 because you're here tonight. But uh, if you're not, feel free to vote for any constituency there. Uh, and uh, those polls are located in between the Students' Union office and um, campus security on the second floor of McEwen Student Center. I'm assuming parking charges apply still when you, when you come to vote. And uh, for anyone who does miss those advanced polls, uh, just a reminder that Election Day is on October 21st. And uh, please just check the uh, city website to find out where your polling station is. Thanks again for coming out, and I'll now pass it on to uh, Priscilla Cherry, our moderator for tonight's event, and uh, really looking forward to get this thing going. Thanks. Thank you, Connor. Stole my speech. No, just kidding. So I want to formally welcome you guys again to the Civic Camp Citizens Ward 1 Councillor Forum. And thank you very much for attending tonight and showing an interest in the issues that shape our city. So like Connor said, my name is Priscilla Cherry. I am with an online radio station called Fresh FM, and I will be your moderator for tonight. So for those of you who are not familiar with Civic Camp, we are a nonpartisan public advocacy group allowing all citizens to engage in creating a city that works for us all. And any Calgarian is welcome to become a Civic Camper just by visiting civiccamp.org and learning more about the organization. So um, Civic Camp, I'd like to thank, sorry, the Civic Camp volunteers. Um, they have donated their time to make tonight's event a reality and we could not have done it um, without their generous sponsors as well. Um, so first I'd also like to thank our host for tonight, UFC, for donating the venue and the Calgary Sound Rentals and Calgary Roadrunners for providing tonight's equipment. And I'd also like to thank our media partners, CBC Calgary, CJSW, Fast Forward Weekly, Fresh FM, and Metro Calgary for helping get the word out about all of our forums. Um, and also like a big thanks to go to Calgary Association of Parents and School Councils and the Alberta Teachers Association for their support with the School Board Trustees Citizens Forum. And another big thank you to the Calgary Foundation as well as the Students Association of Mount Royal and again at U of C who, are, um, who did the Mayoral Citizens Forum and they were our partner in that. And um, again, thank you Connor for the Vice President. And finally, a big thanks to the candidates today and um, let's get started. So first I'd like to cover some ground rules. Um, civic campers have named these forums Citizens Forums. So just again, it's not a debate. And um, the first round of questions for tonight are going to be sourced from Calgarians at large, thanks to uservoice.com. And we have chosen the questions based on the <coughs> questions that have been the most voted by the Calgarians. And we would be choosing the candidates tonight at uh, random. So don't, I'm not gonna be picking on you. And um, the other thing is also for tonight, you guys will be asked four questions each and you'll be provided two minutes to respond. And the candidates that will be asked to respond to each question, um, you will have a chance for the two minutes. And then whoever is not asked directly that question will have a chance to cash in any of the poker chips in front of you. You have three, so use them wisely. And at that point, you will have one minute to respond to the question. Um, and then also, so that's going to be for the, uh, the user voice questions. And then we're also going to have another round for audience questions, which would be more ward specific. 
So I invite you to, um, actually, I think Wendy was the one passing them around. So you, I invite you to um, write your questions right now and then we will gather them at intermission and then we'll ask them um, in the um, second half of the evening. And working with me tonight is Wendy, who will be controlling the clock, so thank you so much. And um, so also on that note, just for major points, please respect the clock and deliver your statements and responses in the time provided. Make it easy for the audience to listen. Do not interrupt other candidates when they speak, please. And please stay focused on the issue. Again, it's um, a forum, not a debate. So please avoid any personal references or criticism directed at your fellow candidates. And lastly, the audience, let the audience decide. So please, we ask that the supporters leave their signs outside where um, campaigning is encouraged. And also lastly, to the crowd, we welcome applauses and any other interruptions will not be tolerated. So um, let's start with the introductions of the candidates. I will start the closest to me, Mr. Harper here. So I invite you now, um, please add two minutes on the clock and just tell us a little bit about yourself and go ahead. You bet. Thank, Thank you, Priscilla. Uh, so my name is Chris Harper and I ran in the 2010 municipal election in Ward 1, uh, coming in a strong second behind Councillor Hodges. Uh, m you know, I chose to run then and I'm choosing to run now because I have a very deep uh, passion and commitment to our community. I, I ran because I feel that I have skills and I have energy that can help make our city and our Ward 1 communities better. And that was what largely motivated me. I also have a professional background in business. And so I, look, I go into organizations and I help them make better use of what they already have so that they can invest in their priorities. And I feel that that's an important thing that our city needs to do as well. Rather than doing more with more or more with less, I want us to focus on making sure we make the best use of what we already have so we can invest in community needs like our recreation centers or established communities that require some investment in the infrastructure there. Uh, and we can ensure that there's safety and that there's energy and possibility in all of our communities through our city, making the best use of what it already has. I've had the privilege of working with some great members of our community uh, through the Federation of Calgary Communities, the Chamber of Commerce, the University of Calgary Senate. Uh, the, uh, I fought against cell phone towers. I, I tried to advocate for our recreation center funding in the Northwest to be protected. And uh, I've also been involved with a group that opposed a casino application in Northwest Calgary. And so I have a really broad understanding of community and I have a very relevant professional background, which I hope to take to City Hall to be able to advocate so that dealing with the city and working with the city can be a pleasure as opposed to a frustration and that the city of Calgary is a supporter and enabler of communities and them reaching the possibilities that they want to achieve as opposed to a barrier, which it sometimes feels like. Uh, so I have a deep commitment to a lot of energy and passion for our community and I would hope to have the opportunity after October 21st to be able to start doing that for all of us. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Harper. Mr. O'Brien? Well, my last name is Hilton O'Brien oh. and I just use the acronym usually HOB makes me John Hobb. It's a lot easier to say than Hilton O'Brien all the time. I grew up in this neighborhood as a matter of fact and spent a lot of my formative years playing on the grounds of the university here. Strangely, I never actually went here for school. I studied social work at Mount Royal, and I got some scholarships and went off to the States and mostly studied philosophy, that is ethics, and a bit of municipal administration and so on on the side with it. So, I became involved with this partly because I was involved in my community association. I live in Bowness, not far from where my father grew up, in fact. And I found that we have an awful lot of people who make tremendous contributions to the community. It isn't the politicians that make the biggest contributions. It isn't the city administration. It really is the citizens through their voluntary organizations. I like that, and I like to see more done with it. In my view, the most important thing that a councillor has, really, is these three fingers, because they make telephone calls. The most important power that a councillor has is an informal one. People will return calls. When you ask people to get together to discuss a specific issue, common to them both that they can solve, 
they'll get together. And that is more effective than any measure passed on council. My particular concerns are affordability for everyone living in the ward, our mobility on transit and on the roads, and our safety both in our neighborhoods and on transit. Thank, Thank you, you, Mr. Hilton O'Brien. Thank you. Ms. Vanderbrink? Good evening, everyone, and thank you so much for coming out and finding out a little bit about the candidates. Um, you're being a very responsible community member by doing so. Closer? So my name is Judy Vandenbrink. There we go. And I, um, I've lived in the ward for 25 years. 24 of those years I lived in Bonas and one year in Silver Springs. While I was in Bonas, I raised two daughters as a single parent. And then I decided that I needed more education, so I came to the University of Calgary, and I have a Bachelor of Science degree. Shortly after getting my science degree, I started an organization called Eco Living Events. It's a nonprofit organization that um, I, thought I saw a need um, for this organization because there was a lot of people in the environmental sector that weren't talking to each other, and I thought that it was really important to make a sustainable city by creating the synergy between uh, the environmental sector. So I'm very proud of the 11 years that uh, Eco Living has been um, ongoing. And one of the projects that I'm really proud of is a, a project called the Winterization Challenge, where we invite volunteers to come up and we teach them very basic winterization techniques. And then we, and I go out and get sponsorship, and then we go out and we uh, winterize seniors' houses. So this has been a really, um, community building initiative because it's usually the community members that are volunteers with this project. I also am a fundraiser with the Heart and Stroke Fund. I am a team leader with the Pathway and River Cleanup. I was a board member with the Bonas Community Association and also am still with the uh, Bonas Community Association with the Planning and Development Committee. I also am with the Silver Springs Community Association and am Open Places um, Natural Spaces. I think that the passion of, um, of a counselor is shown by the way that they get involved. So I am a good voice for the community. Thank you, Mrs. Vandebrink. Mr. Sutherland? Good evening, thanks for coming. I have two daughters and a wife. I've lived in the community for almost 45 years. In fact, I lived only about 20 minutes away from here and used to walk across the lawn. My oldest daughter, hopefully, will become attending the U of C next year. So we have different uh, amount of friends that come around and talk about the challenges. And a lot of my nephews and nieces currently come to university too. I was president of Rocky Ridge Royal Oak. And during this time, I was able to deal with several different challenges. When you're the president of association, you really get to deal with the frontline issues and, and, and talk to the residents on an ongoing basis. You're dealing with development issues with the developer and a backyard problem. You're dealing with speeding issues. You're dealing with graffiti. You're dealing with all the daily life stuff with your different residents. And they're also promoting a community at the same time, creating events, having fun, getting the feeling, making sure things happen together. It's been a pleasure being the president of Rocky Ridge Royal Oak. And then on the other side, I have a business side. Uh, during my time, I was in charge of different regions and top tier companies. I took care of multi-million dollar budgets. And during these budgets, you're responsible for planning and execution on a regular basis. Truly understanding how corporations work is very important, critical part of budgeting and being a counselor because the city of Calgary is a corporation and should be run as a corporation. It's important that you can understand the complex issues. It's important that you understand what the daily people need in order to do so. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Sutherland. Thank you all the candidates for their lovely introductions. So we will begin our first round of questions. And again, it has been drawn at random. The first question is directed to Ms. Vanderbrink and Mr. Sutherland. So the first question is, with a vacancy rate approaching 0%, what long-term action will you take to ensure young professionals and students have a place to live in Calgary? Ms. Mrs. Vanderbrink? Ms. <laughs> Sorry, Ms. Vanderbrink? Well, it's terrible to think that some of the students um, might not be attending University of Calgary or Mount Royal University because of um, the problems with, um, with low 
uh, affordability with with some of our housing and in the interim um, we need to do something so one of the things that I'm doing right now is allowing um, students to come and live at my house and I think that that's something that we're going to have to do is open up our doors and and uh, um, allow some of the uh, the housing to happen with that. I think that it's great to see West Campus development happening because I believe that they really have the right idea as far as looking at mixed use housing. So they're looking at densification as well as the stepping down. So they're looking at multi-family housing as well as um, single housing. And I think that they're, they're really considering affordability um, in this type of a, a housing. And I think that this model can go forward and be very um, beneficial in the future when we're planning other communities. So secondary suites would be one of the, um, the affordable housing options that you could look at, but of course that's not the only answer. Um, I believe that we have to really start looking and, and having developers guide us through some of these um, good models of uh, developments and provide better housing in Calgary. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Vanderbrink. Mr. Sutherland? Hi. It's, the vacancy rate is a, it's a several level issue. Um, first of all, you know, we need to fix the secondary suite issue. It, it's complicated. Uh, it, it's a broken model right now. We need to take a look at the guidelines and uh, the specifics, including the uh, provincial guidelines, whether or not we can do relaxation. They are necessary in certain areas to help relieve the pressure. Additional thing that we need to look at is the available land currently on the University of Calgary for uh, student housing. The land is available and uh, unfortunately it, uh, the building housing has been at a very slow rate. So we need to look at maybe some provincial funding in order to expedite uh, the two towers that are planned and the one that's going to come down. Well, with the current uh, population, perhaps we need more. An additional thing is, uh, I agree with uh, uh, Judy is, in the inner city, we need to do multi-housing in order to get more, more density in order for uh, people to stay. And lastly, we need to look at the whole model of the MVP. Are we pushing one section too hard and not having a balance? So when we have the issues with housing and in the community areas, if there's no balance and there's a crunch, it just adds the additional stress that we're having right now. Thank you, Mr. Sutherland. Would anyone like to respond? Go ahead, Mr. Hilton O'Brien. My day job involves working in finance. I help organizations to raise capital for capital projects. And that's included in the past a very small part in a piece of student housing up in Edmonton, which was funded entirely privately. We didn't need to get funding from the province for it. It's the sort of model that the students here could use. Our real problem in housing is that we just don't have enough. The reason we don't have enough is we don't have a fraction of the apartments Edmonton does because it takes 18 months to approve an apartment building in Calgary. If you ever read, say, The Merchant of Venice, you know that if you've got your money hanging out for 18 months like that, you're waiting around for somebody to come and take a pound of flesh out of you. It's really discouraging. If we can simply fix the process and make it shorter, we'll see more thank housing Thank you, Mr. Hilton O'Brien. Anyone else like to respond, Mr. Harper? No, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so that brings us to our next question. The next question is directed to Mr. Harper, Mr. Hilton O'Brien. The question is, how do you think we can create greater mobility choices in the city and in your ward? Mr. Harper? Uh, well, in our ward, um, for those that are cyclists, um, everyone knows the Bow Crescent is still not paved. Um, and it's actually a major thoroughfare for cyclists uh, in Ward 1 that are commuting to the downtown. And so that's a very simple thing we need to address that would increase mobility uh, through our Ward 1 community specifically. Uh, when it comes to transit itself, uh, I'm, I'm a transit user, although it's been a little bit less the past year because I've got my name all over my car, and so I tend to use that. Uh, but with transit, we need to increase the convenience of it. Um, it was very disappointing to see the Connect Card system uh, not move forward, and I would like to see that project reinitiated because it'll provide valuable data.
to the city of Calgary in terms of ridership so we can schedule frequency based on more accurate numbers as opposed to a lot of the guesswork that has to go into transit planning and scheduling currently. Uh, the other thing that we want to do is we want to make sure that our mobility options within Ward 1 and throughout Calgary are connected. Uh, we have in a lot of communities very great mobility networks for alternative forms of transportation such as walking, cycling, uh, and transit. However, a lot of these uh, different modes aren't actually connected very well in between the communities. And so we really need to identify the opportunities to plug communities into each other so that these alternate forms of transportation can be used and we don't always have to depend on, on our car. We can, we can look at other forms of transportation because it's more convenient, it's better for us, and it's healthy. Uh, right now, I think we've got a ways to go on that, uh, but I know the cycling strategy has come out and that community associations in Bones, for example, are working on a cycling strategy and other methods that we can, as a city, take forward and actually take action on and get implemented, and I would look forward to supporting those efforts. Thank you, Mr. Harper. Mr. Hilton O'Brien? I ride the bus daily as a choice, and I find that there are some little things that would help. It might be good to have the LRT run at nights on a reduced schedule, although I know that would be a somewhat more expensive than the current system. I think we'll see more people using it if it is available. It would also be good if we could simply make sure that we have a little bit more accessibility of bicycle racks on the fronts of buses. I've noticed a lot of people waiting several buses worth just to be able to put their bus their bicycle onto a bus to go somewhere else we don't really need that sort of hassle and certainly we can try to make our transit in general a little more bicycle friendly i think mr harper here has done a very good job of explaining some of the benefits that would come with getting our connect card up and i completely agree most jurisdictions haven't had any meaningful trouble with this now, there is one last thing I should say about transit, though. We do have some concerns about our safety on transit. It's a very common theme. And it can be addressed somewhat, partly by cleaning up some of our LRT stations, which we're in the process of actually doing. But on the buses, really what makes the difference is the availability of things like the city police's PACT team, which is able to respond to trouble calls on city buses. If we were to say simply start measuring the amount of response time to a trouble call on transit, I think we would find that we have much better transit late at night and the system would rapidly become safer simply on the principle that as we measure things, we'll want to improve and we will. Thank you, Mr. Hilton O'Brien. Would anyone else like to respond? Go ahead, Ms. Spindrick. So I think we absolutely do need to improve our trans transit system. Um, adding LRT stations and, and lines is very expensive. And so we need to look at other options. Um, our rapid bus system has been very successful and it should be expanded. We also need to have dedicated bus lanes. I think that that will really help to making, making sure that the buses arrive on time. Um, I heard that Toronto has recently received $600 million for a subway system. How did that happen and how can we go after some of that money that would be wonderful to have in Calgary? How can we lobby to get this funding um, for our LRT station? Um, Ward 1 needs improved cycling lanes um, for commuter traffic. We do have some wonderful lanes that are for recreational, but we don't have commuter traffic. And I know that Bones and Montgomery are both trying to establish um, good commuter cycling lanes that uh, the commuters can actually go over 20 kilometers an hour because if you are on those lanes next to the river, um, you have to really watch yourself uh, first thing in the morning. So I think that we need to establish something like Thank that. Thank you, Ms. Vanderbrink. Thank you. Sorry, you're, that's your time. Would anyone else like to respond? Thank you. The next question is directed to Mr. Sutherland and Mr. Harper. The question is, do you support a city of Calgary living wage policy as the minimum wage is the second lowest in Canada? Mr. Sutherland? Well, first of all, the minimum wage policy is provincial, and that's a provincial matter. In terms of the City of Calgary, we can certainly look at uh, the employees at the City of Calgary and the minimum wage. 
Uh, but more or less, we need to take a look at our, our, our taxation and minimizing taxes and making things affordable for the people because that's what really is the core of the issue. Um, again, at council, we can bring up the minimum wage issue, but it's not a uh, good use of time in terms of uh, authority because we're not the authority and it's really a provincial matter. Thank you, Mr. Sutherland. Mr. Harper? Uh, so a living wage policy essentially establishes a, la a wage by which um, contractors of the City of Calgary and the City of Calgary itself uh, provide a wage to those employed by those individuals and organizations that that is essentially competitive so that they could they would be able to afford uh, the cost of living in, within our city and our province. Um, I think before we would look at a living wage policy, we need to look at the dimensions that surround uh, poverty and those affected by it uh, a little bit more broadly. Uh, we need to look at things in, like ensuring that the jobs that we attract to our city are good quality jobs and jobs that provide stability and benefits to individuals so they can support their family and have dental care and things like that. Uh, we also want to make sure that our transit remains affordable to individuals who have uh, struggles with earning sufficient income to afford mobility within our city. Uh, and one of the ways that we can do that is by reducing the number of times that an individual needs to prove that they're low income. Um, right now, if you want to access a recreation facility under the low income program, or if you want to access transit under a low income program, you need to prove that you're a low income individual several times to the city. And I think that that's unnecessary. And so when we talk about a living wage, that is in response to and assumes that we don't have control over the cost of living in Calgary, and we do. And so my colleague did mention uh, affordable housing through, through less taxation. That's one dimension of it. But we also need to focus on the services and ensuring that from the city of Calgary, they're accessible to all Calgarians and that we prevent people from moving from poverty into homelessness, um, sometimes with their families, that we provide those structures uh, early so that we can prevent them from entering uh, cycles that are more costly and difficult for us to help remove them from. And so, uh, in general, I, I support the idea of ensuring that Calgary remains affordable, that its programs uh, support individuals that may be affected by low income. Uh, but uh, a living wage policy, I think, is only one dimension of that and would have not a very significant impact on the greater picture. Thank you, Mr. Harper. Would anyone else like to respond? Ms. Vanderbrink? We live in a city that some of the people that live here or that um, work here earn six digit figures. And so we're doing very well. We pride ourselves in the great work that we did supporting each other during the floods. So why is it so difficult to move towards taking care of each other by providing a living wage? I think it's very important. If we're going to take care of people, we need to rely less on our social services, and that would also provide extra funding in the long term. So a living wage would benefit society as a whole. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Vanderbrink. Would anyone else like to respond? Thank you. So the next question is directed to Mr. Hilton O'Brien and Ms. Vanderbrink. And the question is, if elected, how will you repair flood-damaged public infrastructure and strengthen Calgary's flood mitigation policies and infrastructure? Mr. Hilton O'Brien? Well, that's not a small question, is it? <laughs> the first thing to notice is that part of our problem in the floods was caused by our dams. Not by our dams themselves, but by the fact that they weren't emptied fully when the flood hit. Had they been emptied f fully as they should have been, we would have had less trouble. That's a provincial matter. To work on this, we have to work with the province. The second thing we can look at doing is working, well, on our sewers. As I think is common knowledge now, the Northwest Sewer Trunk Line is beyond capacity, and some of the flood troubles that we've had this year have been related to that. There have also been some other minor floods in places like Sunnyside related to their sewers. So this is probably an ongoing problem. In the third place, we have a group of dedicated city engineers. They're working right now on a flood mitigation strategy. And to be honest, I propose to get out of their way. They will want to make some things happen. Councillors will be tempted to meddle. 
perhaps that's the sort of thing where we shouldn't be meddling, and instead we should be supporting. So those things, I think, first, working with the province, secondly, upgrading our sewer system, and thirdly, supporting the flood mitigation efforts of our own engineering corps are probably the heart of our, well, any reasonable flood mitigation strategy on the part of council. Thank you, Mr. Hilton O'Brien. Mrs. Van Frank? Ms. So I think flood mitigation um, should have started years ago in 2005 when we had our first flood. I don't understand why something wasn't done. There was all sorts of different uh, ideas and, and policies that were developed, but nothing was followed through. So here we go into 2013, and we've still got our head in the sand. We're not moving forward actually doing something, and I think it's really crucial that we do start um, making sure that we're following through on, on some of these uh, mitigation ideas. So we need to look upstream, look at the dams, look at the waterways, do some dredging with, uh, with our, um, our, our um, reservoirs and uh, making sure that, that at this time, especially in November, the water is quite low. And so we could actually be taking some of the silt out of the rivers and making sure that we shore up the, the banks. This should be happening right now. I also am part of the Planning and Development Committee with Bonas, and we've been fighting um, for a number of years to stop the building along the riverbanks. And I think that that's something that we really need to look at. We need those riparian areas to make sure that we are, of course, taking care of our water by allowing the sediment to settle through the riparian areas. But it also is excellent for flood um, mitigation. We need to also stop building these uh, massive houses along the riverways and allowing, um, allowing them to move closer and closer uh, to the riverbanks. We need to start looking at berms. There's all sorts of mitigation that we need to work on. And I think that going forward, um, we, need to, we need to move ahead and uh, start taking care of this. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Vanderbrink. Would anyone else like to respond? Thank you. So the next question is directed to Mr. Sutherland and Mr. Hilton O'Brien. And that question is, what would a diverse economy in Calgary look like for you? What will you do or what have you done to achieve that? Mr. Sutherland? Part of the uh, master plan of the MDP is to have uh, hubs within communities. Within these hubs, are different types of businesses. They might be retail, uh, business offices, and sportsplex, etc. cetera. Uh, this will help create a diverse uh, community. It'll help create employment within a community. By encouraging and cutting the red tape, it's gonna encourage businesses to come throughout the different places. By giving choice of houses, that's also gonna give opportunity for people to move into different areas. When you're within a community and you have more high density options such as uh, condominiums, et cetera, the prices are lower. So it will change the, the de demographics of the community. So basically following the guidelines and the growth plan uh, of sustaining a new community will help uh, build the diversity. Thank you, Mr. Sutherland. Mr. Hilton O'Brien. I think the most important part of an economy is that the people in it are earning a decent living. And there's a lot that goes into that. First, it's their own efforts that does it. And second, it's the availability of capital. We need to make sure that our people are able to do the work that they need to do. And that means that we do need to work with our government to make sure that we have the sorts of skilled workers that we need. We also need to make sure that we're enough in control of our budget, that we're not marked as being some sort of a, a problematic government that you don't want to put your business under the hands of because we might make some changes that are uh, unpleasant for you. We need to get behind our businesses. Something that goes with this is that we do need to make sure that we're encouraging export. Strangely enough, I think the most neglected 
economy in Calgary is that of art. We don't treat it like an industry. We treat it like some sort of strange social program. What we need to be doing is making sure that our art gets exported. Perhaps instead of bringing very large circles with lampposts on them <laughs> to Calgary, <laughs> we should be making it possible for our artists to put, well, hopefully not quite large circles with lampposts on them in other countries, but at least to do their work in other countries and bring the money back to us. I'm very sick of starving artists. I would really like to see a lot of rich ones. Thank you, Mr. Hilton O'Brien. Would anyone else like to respond? Thank you. And so the last question is for Mr. Harper and Ms. Vanderbrink. And that question is, do you believe that urban sprawl is a problem for the city? If you believe it is a problem, what will you do to address it or what have you done? Uh, so urban sprawl, so our city has grown outward and we have seen a lot of new communities over the past decade. And that's, that's not necessarily a bad thing. Um, you can have suburbs and you can have sub suburbs that are well designed and complete communities that, that don't have the significant infrastructure impacts that suburbs perhaps in the 50s and 60s were designed uh, to have. Uh, sprawl has posed challenges for our city, but I don't think that we should believe either that density is a panacea to that, that density will, will solve all of those issues. Density brings with it its own challenges and opportunities, and I think the approach that we need to have in terms of moving forward is to try and as best we can keep a reasonable balance. Um, I'm very concerned that the pendulum was far to one side, and we're starting to move it over potentially too far to the other side where we're only going to focus on densification, and we need to have balance. Balance is very important to an economy. Balance is very important to ensuring that we have quality of life in our communities. And I think that we have communities today that, that are suburbs that do have density in them around the LRT stations, for example, or major transit routes. And, and I don't think that that's a bad thing, but we need to have balance. In the past, we probably haven't had balance. And I'm concerned in the near future, we might have the opposite end of the spectrum and have a different kind of imbalance where we're introducing too much density and not considering the infrastructure costs of that. And so a lot of talk has been about uh, about the, the levies that are paid on new home lots in, in growing communities and new communities. But the following question that's going to come after that is how density also pays for itself. And that question is going to be a much more complicated one to explore uh, when it comes to the infrastructure upgrades to, required to support density. And we're going to see that question likely come up in the next four years under the council that's elected on October 21st. So I think that sprawl has posed some challenges for us, and I think that we're working to address them, but I want to make sure we keep a reasonable balance between our growth, both inside the city and out. Thank you, Mr. Harper. Ms. Vanderbrink? So I have strong opinions of ur uh, urban sprawl. I can't believe that anybody would say that there's nothing wrong with urban sprawl. I don't know anybody that says that they want to spend more time sitting in traffic in their cars. The added burden on our infrastructure as well. Um, when the existing infrastructure is failing, we must stop destroying our precious farmland. Reduce, reuse, and recycle includes land. We can't eat our houses. <laughs> this will, rec if, if we look at, um, This will create a better tax base um, by looking at uh, densification, and um, we need to start taking care of our um, core infrastructure. We need to stop having the inner city paying for suburbia, and I do believe that that is happening, and the city needs to embrace quali uh, quality and standards of um, leading developers. There are some developers that are doing an amazing job and um, we need to start rewarding them and offering incentives. Um, we need to also take care of what we're leaving for our next generation. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Vanderbrink. Mr. Sutherland? The, the area of development's been very complex, but what it comes down to is proper information and proper facts. As I said on the last forum is, uh, I do not believe that the inner city is paying for the suburbs. When you look at the costing to do uh, development and a redevelopment, depending on the age, if it's 80 years or more, 
the cost will be significantly more. However, I think the bigger point is it is not our job as a government to tell you how and where to live. That is your decision. 85% or more live in the suburbs. Why? Because they like it. They want a yard, they want a barbecue, they like their neighbors, they do sports. I live in a suburb, I love it. If you want to live in inner city, great, and you love it, that's great too. But one should not be at the expense of the other. Thank you, Mr. Sutherland. Mr. Harper? I just, I, on, the, on this topic, I, I really, I, I ran because, because of my involvement with community in Calgary, because I enjoyed making our city better. I don't believe that we have two cities in Calgary where one is in the suburbs and one is in the core. At the end of the day, we have to work together as a city to make sure that we get the investment, that we get the, the funding from the provincial and federal governments, that we get that feeling that we have when we're in a neighborhood that we can feel good about. We have to work together about that. The one thing that disappoints me absolutely significantly about the discussion about urban sprawl is that it makes suburbs and it feel like, feel like they're dirty places and it makes the inner city feel like they're subsidizing and that really divides Calgarians and I don't think that that is good. You know, it, it may be true that perhaps there is some inequity and that it'll be equalized but at the end of the day we're one city and we need to work together to make Calgary the best city possible and we can't do that if we think that we're different people within our communities. Thank you, Mr. Harper. All right. Um, thank you, everyone, for taking your seats. Welcome back to the Civic Camp Citizens Ward 1 Council Forum. So before we get to um, the questions that you have submitted, we have one more round of um, questions submitted online. And so um, two minutes on the clock. Thank you. And the first question goes to Mr. Harper and Mr. Sutherland. And the question is, how will you ensure all Calgarians have access to the recreational and sports facilities they need for their ongoing health and well-being? Mr. Harper. Thank you. Um, well, in, in our ward specifically and across Calgary, recreation centers play a very important part. Um, the Northwest Recreation Center Ward 1 is due to start construction in December, but as an individual who's watched every meeting of council and committee for the past three or so years, uh, I know that it's very important that the councillor for Ward 1 and the other wards that are also receiving these rec centres keep their eye on that ball to make sure that the funding stays in place, that that rec centre gets started and when it is underway, that it is uh, completed on time and on budget. We don't like over budget and, uh, and overestimated time durations. The other thing I want to do is, as when I was on the board of the Federation of Calgary Communities, uh, I got to see a lot of recreational programming provided through community associations. In Northwest Calgary and in Ward 1, we have a very unique asset called the Alliance for Active Aging that provides recreation opportunities for active aging for seniors in our community. And the nice thing is that it's senior-led and it's senior-owned and it's volunteer-driven and they do wonderful things. And I think that the city and the councillor for Ward 1 really needs to actively support programs like that. We see community associations also offering soccer programming and some winter ice rinks and skating for the kiddos. And these are lots of different ways that community associations and organizations provide recreation at an extremely cost-effective way. Uh, and the city should be supporting and enabling and removing barriers for community associations and other like-minded individuals to do that on a voluntary basis. It provides a really good value for our neighborhoods and it provides a really great asset for our communities that I would like to see that supported and continue. Thank you, Mr. Harper. <laughs> Mr. Sutherland. Thank you. Well, I was a coach of uh, soccer, so uh, with my daughters, with Calgary West, so we had the uh, luxury of driving uh, all over Calgary with the limited facilities. We've had many challenges. Uh, you know, I've lived in Rocky Ridge, like I mentioned, for 17 years, and when you take Rocky Ridge, Royal Oak, um, and Tuscany, and Crestmont, and Valley Ridge, you basically have 70,000 people that have not had a rec center for 20 years. Unacceptable. So how am I gonna make a difference with the rec center? Well, I've been involved in the rec center. I know the design, and there's actually a design flaw right now, which they need to work on. And there's a budgeting issue with the rec center right now. Uh, one of the advantages that I've had is I've done construction uh, with various uh, restaurants, businesses, retail in my profession and I have the ability and the skill set to look at budgeting and to take a look at the current budget that it has now. 
I find it highly unlikely that they're going to get it on budget because when you look at the comparable facilities, they're almost $100 million and the current budget for this one is $70 million. So I need to question currently where it's at. Green spaces, parks, etc. they're recreational. They're important too. They ensure that they're going to be kept. And uh, thank you, Chris, for mentioning the Triple H program that I've uh, promoted from day one. Yes, that's a great program. Our seniors need to be involved, and you're, you're very correct, and I'll continue to support that program. Like I mentioned in my platform, this is a program that uh, it's a pod system, and I'd like to expand it to all the different uh, communities so uh, our active aging people are, are uh, confident and be able to do it. We also have a program called Community Investment Fund, and that program is for long-term investments of recreation areas, and we need to continue to focus on that program and make sure it's funded. Thank you, Mr. Sutherland. Mr. Harper? Oh, I'm good. Oh, you're okay? Okay, thank you. Um, okay, so the next question is directed to Mr. Sorry, Mr. Hilton O'Brien and Ms. Vanderbrink. So the question is, with the government initiating a plan to support local sustainability in the food system, can we expect a positive move towards urban agriculture? Mr. Hilton O'Brien? Sorry, I, I missed part of that. No problem. With the government initiating a plan to support local sustainability in the food system, can we expect a positive move towards urban agriculture? Well, I know a gentleman named Paul Hughes who's had some plans along those lines for years. Some of the plans he's mentioned have been quite colorful. I believe he belonged to a, some sort of organization that called for us to be able to cultivate chickens in our backyard that had an acronym called CLUCK. <laughs> that was colorful. However, along with that, I noticed that he had some thoughts about how to encourage agriculture along the sides of uh, freeways where we have a good deal of empty green space. Some of the communities, like my own uh, community association in Bonas, have actually been helping to run, uh, what do you call it, community gardens and raised beds. In fact, we're in the process of trying to move one of those community gardens closer to our community center. As long as what we're doing is making sure that we're enabling people to do some sorts of agriculture or increasing the, the gardening that we're doing, I think that's a good thing. What we do need to do, though, is get out of their way. We don't need to spend a lot of money on it because this is something that people really want to do for themselves. But again, we have to get out of their way, make sure that they aren't tied up with too many regulations in order to do what they need to do, and make sure that the ground rules for doing it are clear and simple and well-defined so that anyone can follow them. So by all means, let us have a little more urban agriculture within reason. Thank you, Mr. Hilton O'Brien. Ms. Vanderbrink? So with all the new community gardens that are being built, you can see that there's a renewed interest in growing your own food. Um, these days, it's not just a social initiative, although there is a part of that. Um, it's knowing where our food is actually coming from is very important. I'm a gardener and uh, would definitely support urban agriculture in all forms, including chickens in the backyard, as long as it was actually done properly and we've, we've followed policies and procedures and made sure that um, the, the, the uh, people that have the chickens know how to take care of them. Um, we need more self-reliance and one of the ways to do that is by actually growing our own food. Um, there are other benefits as well, which include um, fresh air and exercise when we're out working in our urban gardens. Um, so I'm, I'm also very supportive of green roof initiatives. So that's also got something to do with the urban gardening. And uh, I believe that it would be uh, very beneficial to uh, use the, the green space as a carbon sink and reduce our greenhouse gas emissions as well. Thank you. 
Thank you. In other words, the buck, buck, buck stops here. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Ms. Van der Brink. Would anyone else like to respond? Thank you. So that brings us to the end of our crowdsourced questions. Everyone, calm down. Um, so now we will get to our audience-sourced uh, questions. And so everyone will have a chance to answer two questions each. And again, you'll get two minutes. And you can still use your chips in this round for one minute uh, response. So the first audience-sourced question is for Mr. Sutherland and Ms. Vanderbrink. So the question is, there are massive developments being proposed west of COP and south of Highway 1. What specific actions will you take to ensure they are done sustainably and responsibly? And what challenges do you anticipate? Big question. Mr. Sutherland. Uh, the development uh, around COP and also uh, proposed development um, across from uh, COP uh, near Grimbriar then there's also the expansion of uh, Qualico Homes going west and also Valley Ridge. So the combinations are very complex because it's going to involve three interchanges. The interchange at uh, COP needs to be revamped. The interchange at Valley Ridge needs to be done. And the interchange west uh, of Valley Ridge, the third one also needs some adjustment. So. When you come to developments, one of the main uh, philosophies that I have and I, and I think should be supported in terms of the MDP is you don't do any development without proper infrastructure. You must have the proper roadways, you must have the proper intersections before you do the development. Not after, before. Because if you don't do that, it causes additional money, frustration, uh, problems for everybody. So the basic bottom line is those intersections are going to have to get completed uh, in order for those developments to go forward. Thank you, Mr. Sutherland. Ms. Vanderbrink? Well, I've actually been involved with the Planning and Development Committee with the, with, uh, the Bonesse Community Association and have uh, been very active in uh, uh, stopping one of the uh, proposed developments um, just below Canada Olympic Park where they were going to put big box stores um, as part of the development and what a way to ruin our legacy with uh, Canada Olympic Park and so we were very happy to be successful to um, to stop that. Of course they will have to look at doing some developments in that area because um, it, it's available, they need to start um, gain, getting some funding back, the city needs funding for the money that they've put out to uh, to support wind sport, so but we, we need development that actually supports what is already there, and it is the gateway to our community. So we want to make sure that the, the 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 developments that they're putting in there are going to be not an eyesore like a big box store would be. Infrastructure is crucial, but not just roads. We need to make sure that we have transit, we need to have bike lanes, we need walkways, we need green space that links up so that we can get to each of the um, developments as well. I know that I've heard one, um, or I've seen plans for one of the development and they've, they've actually done a really good job of making sure that it's developed into the hill. And so they're developing in layers so that the parking is below. So what we see when we come in and see are at um, one of these malls, for instance, is not a huge parking lot of cars. They're actually going to, to bury the cars and um, have different levels of uh, the, um, not bury the cars, but you know what I mean, to put <laughs> level parking lots, underground ground parking lots. Yeah, let's bury those cars. Um, <laughs> so I think that it's really important, as uh, Ward has mentioned, that the infrastructure, but not just roads, we need to also be looking at uh, transit. Um, interchanges are very expensive, so we need to make sure that we manage that as well. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Vanderbrink. Would anyone else like to respond? Thank you. So the next question is directed to Mr. Harper and Mr. Hilton O'Brien. And the question is, what volunteerism have you done in your community? Mr. Harper. Oh, boy. Um, so I've, I've been on the board of an organization It was uh, called Community Links that provided social services, uh, wraparound services for for families and single parents. Uh, I've been on the University of Calgary Senate. I spent, uh, I think, about five years with the Federation of Calgary Communities um, and was president for a year on there as well. And I sat on various committees. 
I have uh, also been involved with the Rotary Club of Calgary. I currently sit on the board there. And uh, I sit on, I think, four committees at the Rotary Club of Calgary and still do that <laughs> despite running for, uh, for office right now. Uh, I feel volunteerism is very important and, and continue to do that despite my campaign manager telling me that that's not a good choice right now. Um, what else have I been on? Uh, been, I volunteered with Harvest Fests and very local community issues like that. Um, got, got a group of Tuscany folks together and, and rallied to very vocally express our opinion on a 60 meter cell phone tower that was proposed near 12 Mile Cooley Park. Uh, I worked with a group to distribute flyers regarding a casino application that was proposed near Royal Oak and Rocky Ridge. Uh, just very much enjoy being a part of my community. I've, I've volunteered with Certified Management Consultants of Alberta. I've been on four committees at the Chamber of Commerce, one of which was a policy realignment task force to increase the Chamber's effectiveness at communicating policy and generating policy from the members' uh, perspectives. And, and I've done all of that simply because uh, it started off as a way when I came here I didn't know anybody. And my volunteerism was a way I wanted to get to know people and I got carried away with it. And it was something that my parents had put in, my sister and I as young children. And I very much enjoy being involved in community. Uh, I still am despite running uh, for political office right now. And, and I would certainly see myself continuing to be a volunteer as well as a city councillor after the October 21st municipal election. Thank you, Mr. Harper. Mr. Hilton O'Brien. I've spent the last two years on the board of the Bowness Community Association, and I, like Judy, have sat on the Planning and Development Committee and have personally lobbied aldermen to help stop a pro inappropriate development. I'm also on the, or a member of the Bowness Lions Club. Uh, we've had a lot of nice little successes, including building oh, uh, a nice little scout hall for our residents. I'm a member of the Legion of the Knights of Columbus. And in the past, I have been on a whole whack of boards. I was a member of Interfaith, of which you see the remainder as the Interfaith Food Bank. But once upon a time, we had clothing stores and even a furniture store and so on, and did a lot of other things along that line. I've also been uh, on the board of a homeless shelter and helped to build a new one. I have even organized science fiction conventions in the city, which is probably the very strangest qualification you've ever heard from anybody sitting at the front of one of these rooms. But it actually taught me a whole lot about working with people and how you can get about 2,000 volunteer hours working together in a year. It's been very interesting and rewarding working with some of these community groups, and it's always reminded me that when it comes to what happens, the, well, you know, the city is not the be-all, end-all. It's our informal organizations that really matter to us. Thank you, Mr. Hilton O'Brien. Would anyone else like to respond? No? Thank you. So the next question is again from Mr. Harper and Mr. Hilton O'Brien. And the question is, if elected, at the end of your term, what would you like to report as your greatest accomplishment? Mr. Harper? Well, I, for me, I wouldn't say it's any one piece of infrastructure. Um, of, course, of course, I would hope that the Rec Center in Northwest Calgary would be completed by the end of my first term. Um, but I've committed to a two-term limit on City Council. I think it's good to have new ideas and new blood come into City Council. And so I've, I've made that commitment publicly myself. And at the end of that eight years, what I would like to have said what I accomplished with my communities, not just myself, you can't do these sorts of things alone. I, w I wish that I would have accomplished, uh, that our communities would be places that we can all feel good about. That City Hall is something, is an organization and a community that people feel supports them and what they're trying to do to make their communities the best places possible. Uh, I, want to, I want to make sure that our Ward 1 communities are connected to one another, that they're sharing ideas, that they're supporting one another in the challenges and opportunities that each of them face. And, and that is something that I think would be wonderful uh, for me to have said I was a part of. However, also recognizing that that is not something that is, I could possibly achieve alone. Um, wh what would give me greatest sort of warm and fuzzy is that, that we, we brought communities together, that we, that we did these things together, 
that we achieve these results together. And, and that's the role of a city councillor, is to, to bring communities, to bring people together, to facilitate the process in a very constructive and positive way, and to, to talk about opportunities and possibilities and pathways towards them. And, and I want, at the end of my, my two terms, uh, if I'm elected and re-elected, I want to be able to say that I help community do those things, and I want community to be able to say that they agree. Thank you, Mr. Harper. <laughs> Mr. Hilton O'Brien. I was one of the founders of the Wild Rose Party of Alberta, and one year I was its president, and I occupied several senior roles. And now, I don't sit on the board of that organization, and I don't need to. It's quite capable and runs nicely without me. And if I'm a councillor, that's what I want to be able to say about the communities in my ward, that they run a little better, that they're a little stronger, that they have more rights, more funding, but in the end, that they don't need me. I think that's important. You see, every time you intervene, whether it's in politics or in social work with a person, an intervention has a beginning, a middle, and an end. If it doesn't have an end, you've created yourself a job. You haven't helped anyone. That's one of the things that's most missing from public policy in our country. We often forget that. So I want to make sure that my time ends and ends cleanly. And when I'm done, I'm not needed anymore because what I did will last. Thank you, Mr. Hilton O'Brien. Would anyone else like to respond? Thank you. So the last audience <clears throat> Sorry, audience sourced question is directed to Mr. Sutherland and Ms. Vanderbrink. And the question is, how would you work with the other levels of government in your ward? Mr. Sutherland. Okay, uh, thank you. As uh, president of Rocky Ridge Royal Oak, uh, I had the pleasure of working with uh, different levels of government already. So I've already had that experience uh, dealing with the oil well issue. Uh, also, uh, I've had a good relationship with the MP, although we haven't been able to do much federally in our community, uh, I've built a good relationship with that. So uh, I have the experience of working with the city, working with the province, and I have the contacts with the federal government. Thank you, Mr. Sutherland. Ms. Vanderbrink? Well, I actually think um, an idea of a city charter is needed to clarify um, some of the rules in uh, city council. And I would like to see um, that because there seems to be so many conflicts right now between the different levels of government. So um, I think that the, the city council or city charter would uh, establish um, some of the rules a, a lot clearer, as well as give municipal government a, a little uh, more room as to um, collecting uh, financing for some of the projects. It's really difficult when all of a sudden um, some of the funding is taken away when, for instance, with the rec centers, um, the, the money was there, it's gone. It's, so we have to look at different options. So it would be good to establish a good relationship via a charter so that it is, um, it is clear and um, all levels understand. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Vanderbrink. Uh, Mr. Harper. Thank you. Um, we, need to look, we need to look at it a little bit more broadly. Levels of government aren't just, government is equal. Um, we have school board trustees that we also need to make sure that we build respectful and, and good relationships with so that when schools are put in, we can ensure there's alignment between the speed limits and things like that around the school so that we can ensure that the communities are satisfied that their safety concerns are addressed when new school sites are put forward. Um, through the Calgary Regional Partnership, we also need to make sure that municipalities are cooperating, working together as a region. Uh, we all share the same Bow River, we share the same land and the same food, and we have transportation and infrastructure demands. We're much stronger when we speak as a voice and as a consistent and aligned voice. And the Calgary Regional Partnership provides a great opportunity for that. Provincially and federally, it's absolutely important that we have relationships based on respect and understanding. And we may not always agree, but I think that that's okay and we shouldn't always agree but we should be able to at least have a mature adult conversation about the needs of municipalities with the provincial and federal level, levels of government so that we can ensure we get results that we can count on. Thank you, Mr. Harper. 
Would anyone else like to respond? Thank you. So that brings us to the end of our um, audience sourced questions. This is going to be the last round of questions. And um, so sometimes it's difficult to provide specifics in a small brochure or on your website. Um, so this is the chance to provide details. And this round is called the how round. And you can put your coins away because you can't use them in this round. So you will have a chance to answer um, something specific to your campaign. And you will have 30 seconds. And so we can do this in the opposite order that we did. Um, actually, sorry, we will do this in the same order that we did the introductions. And so um, I have done my little research, and so I will start with you, Mr. Harper. What else dumpers here? <laughs> 30 seconds on the clock, please. All right. We're being generous today. You guys get 45 seconds. All right. <laughs> so, Mr. Harper. So um, your slogan is community you can feel. Mm -hmm. A key part of your campaign is to reduce the burden on taxpayers by investing in community priorities without the increase in taxes. So how do you plan to accomplish this? So my professional background is essentially I look at how work is performed and I redesign the work process so that we get more of what we already have. I've done that in the private sector for six years. Um, I've worked with unions on achieving these sorts of results. I have a background and a degree in human resources and labor relations. And how we would do that is that the Cut Red Tape initiative needs to be made permanent. Uh, right now it's been an initiative and it's been about food trucks, but it is an enormous opportunity to make sure we transition that into the correct behaviors and attitudes at the city, and that we focus on getting the most of what we already have. That starts when new services are brought forward to council. It starts with the design of those services. It starts with the design of communities. And we need to bake efficiency and effectiveness into how work is performed at those levels, rather than correcting that later on. Thank you, Mr. Harper. And so Mr. Hilton O'Brien, in your campaign, you mentioned that the most fundamental purpose of a city is economic. How do you plan to see through your plan of having affordable yet safe living environments? What matters for affordable and safe living environments is first that we have some. We need to build some houses and some apartments. Now, in the Northwest, we won't be seeing one single house built until we get our sewer main fixed. We need to build a new one. The city says it'll take five years. I think we can expedite that. I've heard some estimates using contractors of around the one to one and a half year mark, simply by doing it all at once and connecting. And mostly, we really have to fix the process that we approve new developments of apartment buildings in. 18 months is not acceptable. Oh, sorry. Thank you, Mr. Hilton O'Brien. And Ms. Vanderbrink. The infrastructure is a key part of your campaign that you have mentioned is the number one priority. How do you plan to strengthen the city's infrastructure system? Well, by prioritizing is the, the number one way to strengthen infrastructure. We need to figure out exactly what infrastructure is the most important. And right now, as John has just mentioned, is we need to manage the underground pipes. And that needs to be done immediately. Um, moving forward, we can't continue building roads and roads and roads because we can't maintain what we have right now. We need to look at alternatives like looking at transit and making sure that it runs smoothly. We also need to have good bike lanes and good uh, uh, pedestrian pathways. I think that that would um, alleviate a lot of the issues, as well as stop with the urban, urban sprawl. If, we have, um, if we're building in, internally in, and uh, increasing density, we won't have as much need on the infrastructure. Thank, Thank you. you, Ms. Vanderbrink. And lastly, Mr. Sutherland. Mm -hmm. One of the number one focuses in your campaign is fiscal restraint with taxpayers' money through a zero-based taxation budgeting process. How do you plan to see this through? Well, this is one of the main things and why I'm running also fiscally is I really think there uh, uh, needs to be a business, more of a business acumen on council in looking at the overall budgets and understanding them. And, uh, with our current increases are, are, are totally unacceptable, 30% over the last three years. The process has to be done through, it's simple and it's done in 99% in of the businesses around in this world, because if you don't do it, you're not going to be around. That's simply, you are not budgeting for an increase. You're going to have to look at what you have, 
and uh, the programs, and you must prioritize. That's part of doing business. Thank you. All right, so that ends our questions for the evening. At this time, I'd like to invite our candidates to close um, their night and just um, do a summary. So um, we will do this in the same direction that we've been going. So I will invite Mr. Harper just to, um, you guys will get one minute each, oh. sorry. <laughs> and so just, um, just a summary and um, yeah, that's it. <laughs> yeah. Um, Thank you, Mr. Harper. You're welcome. Uh, so I, I'm running again because I care deeply about Calgary. I care deeply about our communities. I want our communities to be places that we can feel good about, places that we can feel safe in. And I want us to see us build a future that we can say we are proud of and that we built together. Um, that's so important. Um, Councillors like Dale Hodges have brought a lot of investment to our Ward 1 communities and, and to Calgary and gave us the opportunities and the choices that we have today. And I really want to make sure that councils in the future and generations in the future have those same opportunities and choices so that they can exercise their creativity and their opportunities just as we are today and just as we were before us. Uh, there is nothing that I would enjoy more than to work hard every day for our Ward 1 communities at City Hall and to represent our city in Calgary and to be an ambassador. And it's time for my generation to step up and take responsibility. And I stand as an individual who will hope to achieve that and make you feel good about what we're able to do together. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hudson mm -hmm. Mr. Hudson O'Brien. My grandfather came here over 100 years ago. And in the 30s, he built his house in this ward. And over the last century, my family has been a lot of different things here. We've been a lot of different people. We've been coal miners and we've been musicians. We've been mechanics and we've been social workers. We've been homeless and we've been millionaires. Sometimes the same person on some of these. And I feel very much connected to the whole community from the top to the bottom. These are, to me, my people, my community. And to work for them and to fight for them, as you must with City Hall, doesn't seem like a burden to me. It seems like the fulfillment of a prophet, of a promise. And it feels like a very good thing. Thank you, Mr. Hilton O'Brien. Ms. Van Debray? So a great voice for a community is someone who listens to the concerns of all stakeholders, researches solutions, and strives to achieve an, an enduring, balanced results. An effective counselor must have a variety of, of life skills, um, a history in the ward, a good formal education, critical uh, research skills, an ability to set priority, priorities and the ability to make the hard decisions. We are all the same here. We want to be healthy, we want to have a sense of belonging, and we want to feel an important part of society. Your voice will be heard if you elect me as your counselor. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Vanderbrink. Mr. Sutherland? Well, we all have passion. If we didn't have passion, none of us would be up front here today. We want to all want to do better. That's all common. So what really separates us, we have to ask ourselves, what are the skill sets? Well, I have extensive business background in large corporations. I understand large corporations, how to budget. We're going to have a challenging time over the next four years because of the flood. Do you want to depend on visions or do you want to depend on individuals that have proven results? Proven results in the community, proven results also in business. Experience counts. It makes a difference. You don't make the same mistakes. You make fact-based decisions. You don't have an alliance to parties of any type. I am running as an independent counselor in Ward 1. I will do the job for you. You have my commitment. You have my passion. As I mentioned before, that City Hall should be 20% of the time and in the community, 75% of the time. You have my commitment. Thank you, Mr. Sutherland. All right.
great, everyone. That actually brings us to the end of our night. We made it. And a big thank you to Civic Camp and the citizens who provided the questions tonight. Um, thank you to all our sponsors, CBC Calgary, CJSW, Fast Forward Weekly, Fresh FM, Metro Calgary, Calgary Sound Rentals, Calgary Road Runners. And um, thank you to my supporters tonight, Peter, Wendy, and a big thank you to um, Andrew as well and Connor. And thank you to all of you for coming tonight and participating um, in what's important in the city. And a huge thank you to the candidates today. So let's give them a round of applause. And sorry, lastly, I'd like to also thank Chelsea Pratchett with um, LivestreamCalgary.com, who was streaming all of the forums, all 18 events. So she made it through all 18. She still has a little bit to go. So thank you, Chelsea, for streaming that live. And don't forget to vote October 21st. Thank you, everyone. Good night. No worries.